The third speaker is Winston Nagan and uh, is, uh, you know, a distinguished uh, uh, human rights uh, defender, more than anything I would, uh, uh, you know, see him as. Also, he's the chair of the board of trustee of our academy and the director of the Institute for Human Rights, Peace and Development of the University of Florida. It's a profound insight to recognize that we are not only in the process of being, we are in the process of becoming. And education is one of the most profound instruments for helping us to realize that process of becoming. Now, the, the evolution of education and, and progress has been a painfully slow one in human history. What has happened is that we have an acceleration of this, an exponential change in the quantum and the form and even the ideas about what knowledge is and so forth. And a great deal of what we now know only uh, underlies the fact about how little we know so that the challenges are enormous, not just for teachers, but also for students. I want to focus on the students. Uh, I do not, I think it's a mistake to ever look at students as the objects of education. They are the subjects of education. They are the centerpiece of education. And education begins, doesn't end, but it begins certainly with the students. Uh, and I want to illustrate this with some examples that I have experienced as a student, radical I might add. Uh, when I went to the university in South Africa, it was directly taken over by the state and it was uh, filled up with fascists. And the job of these fascist professors was to instill in us the idea that we were racially inferior, that we had no future, and our job was to comply or else. Uh, what we got was a horrible form of education and it was quite clear that if we were going to be educated we need to find some other way to do so. Uh, what we did was we organized student groups. Uh, we researched these things and found other sources of information, shared those with us and frequently insights came out in these groups that were unusual. For example, one freshman student discovered Abraham Lincoln and the phrase government of the people, for the people, by the people. One morning when we got up, the entire university was plastered with the, these letters, government of the people, for the people, by the people. And around the university were about 30 or 40 Saracen armored cars searching for the night painters, you see, so. <laughs> uh, uh, and so uh, there was this resistance. One of the cornerstones of our student resistance was we had to find some models or values to which we could aspire. And we distributed the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. We found all the other instruments that the, uh, that the UN had put up, and, and, and the authorities there considered the Universal Declaration of Human Rights to be an instrument of great subversion. You see, so, so, but it, it helped us in organizing, uh, on a horizontal basis, uh, a counterpoint to what the state was doing. Well, one of the outcomes of this was there was an emergence of uh, one of the most important anti-apartheid groups in South Africa, the Fort Hare Resistance Movement. And many of those guys became leaders subsequently. Uh, but they kept alive the flame that uh, these anti-humanistic uh, racist policies of the state were nothing that South Africans wanted for themselves. Now, I, I, I escaped and I went to Oxford and there was a different system. And I actually thought at the end of the day, it was the most brilliant system of education ever put up by the mind of man. It was a tutorial system and most people think about a tutor at the top and the rest of us. In fact, all the tutors was they gave you a big reading list and you had to organize it yourself. It was so difficult that no one person could ever do that alone, so we had to collaborate with other students. And then because the work sometimes covered other fields, we had to get a philosopher to come in or an economist or whatever. But we organized these groups, huh? we organized these groups in such a way that most of the education was horizontal. It was the students exchanging, educating, working through these things. And then at the end of all, you had to see the tutor and so on. Now you've got some guidance. I wrote an essay on a brilliant 
English philosopher. I was scared to say anything bad about him. But my tutor looked at this thing and he said, Oh no, I want Nagin on Austin, not this other stuff. And, and, and like went up in my head, you know, I have a brain, I can think, I can comment on this originally. And that changed my life after that. Well, shortly I got it. The next essay I wrote was on Lord Hoho. It was an Irishman who escaped to Nazi Germany and, and made the most hilarious fun of the British aristocracy. They hated him. After the war, they grabbed him, put him on trial, and convicted him for treason. Now, he wasn't a British citizen. How on earth could he be convicted for treason? So I wrote this essay, and I really attacked the House of Lords, this hallowed institution. So, and at the end of it, I said, you know, sir, it looks to me like this hallowed institution of English justice got their pound of flesh. <laughs> the man wrote back, he said, this whole essay is what you think. You could at least say it is submitted. I said, oh. But when I read further down, he said, and incidentally, Lord Porter was brave enough to dissent. I got him. I got him. You see, he had to admit that they had really railroaded this guy. Well, the, the horizontality of the Oxford system and the richness of student interchange was a law. 90% of education took place there, not with teachers pontificating the law. I went to the States and I had another experience. And this was with the casebook method, which had been invented by the Harvard Law School Dean Christopher Columbus Langdale. One of my Yale professors said, Langdale was an essentially stupid man. He had one good idea to which he clung with all the tenacity of genius. <laughs> and this was the casebook. Uh, 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 when I went to the class, a hundred students. I said, what the hell is this? This is a downgrade from where I had been. But in fact, it was a genius method. Uh, the teacher had no notes. Came in there and he looked around and he, he had given us some readings in advance. He, said he called on somebody and the somebody answered and asked a question. The teacher took the question and put it to somebody else. That person had another question and went to somebody. And within 15 minutes, the class was buzzing. Everyone was going at each other and whatever. I realized I better take some notes out of this. In fact, the, 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 the Socratic method as deployed even with 100 students was one of the most effective methods of, uh, of learning and it was largely the students. Uh, a few stimulating well-chosen questions could get an enormous amount of horizontal interaction amongst the students and up to today it is considered to be the, one of the most effective instruments of higher education teaching. Now there's some hidden issues behind this you see, the casebook method. Okay? One of the things that it did for the student was it permitted the student to identify problems. And you know, if you can't figure out what the problem is, you're not going to go anywhere. But even more importantly, it gave the student the tool to predict problems. And you know, we don't teach that, but <laughs> if you can predict the problem, you've got a long way to solving it. So you, you hear the, the casebook method gives you not only problem identification, problem prediction, but it implicates fundamental values, so it forces you to think about what are the consequences of going one way or the other. It gets you into thinking about choice and decision. And so uh, a choice and decision tie in with problem solving. So there was a, a real profound genius in what uh, Langdale had come up with, and it's still the preferred method in every American law school today. I think the business schools borrow some of this, but I'm not impressed with what they do because the guys come to the sea with closed minds and they leave with, leave with even closer uh, minds. So I'm not quite sure that they, they get the point, you know. <laughs> but, uh, but in any event, uh, 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 what I experienced was that most of my learning was a matter of the horizontal experience. And if you had a very, very good teacher, he knew what questions to pose. And once you could build on those questions, you could build on a solid base. And what would you get out of education? The most important thing I think a student can get out of education is that they know the problem, okay? And they can predict the problem and they can figure out a way to solve it by choice.